was like kind of discovering like uh, what's the future of storytelling. Because in uh, Algeria Media Institute, we don't know what's the right and wrong. We don't look for the things from the angle of right and wrong. We believe with experimental mentality and keep testing how the, the technology intersects with the, like uh, journalism. Uh, today, like we have a special team who's working on like uh, virtual reality and the 360 technology because it's not about like to have a drone only. Everybody has a drone now or 360. What is the new, how, what you can add for the story from editorial uh, uh, point of view? Everyone can use 360 today. If you can't add, you can't add anything, so it has, it has no value. So we keep experimenting in Al Jazeera under like the concept of uh, a media lab, and today we have a team, special team dedicated. We call it the Contrast uh, VR team. They are dedicated in 360 and virtual reality technology in storytelling and applying this in the field. Uh, uh, I would like to introduce uh, my colleague uh, Joy, she's from the con uh, Contrast uh, VR team. Uh, she will lead the workshop and later on will join us uh, our colleague Victoria as well. Joy uh, um, uh, has been in Jordan and she covers the refugees story, uh, Syrian refugee story from in Jordan, refugees camps, and uh, Victoria she has covered like uh, the refugees Rohingya uh, crisis in uh, Myanmar and uh, neighbor Bangladesh. Uh, in the same time, we are glad also in this today or, or tomorrow we are going to publish like uh, the new guidebook. We have just published such a guidebook on uh, for a journalist on covering refugees uh, story. We will publish this uh, tomorrow. It's a, it's a good guidebook for journalists who has no background on covering uh, refugees. In Al Jazeera, we start documenting our experience, not only Al Jazeera experience. Even in this book, we have talked to many like journalists uh, from like. Uh, Arab and Western uh, uh, media, because uh, 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 we have to <coughs> bring our experience and transform it into a knowledge and make it available for all journalists in uh, the field. Uh, I would like to introduce Joyce, who will lead uh, uh, this workshop, and after we finish, we can might open the door for uh, discussion. You have the mic, uh, Joyce. Hi, uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming out on a Saturday afternoon. Um, so as he mentioned, I am Joy. And my colleague Victoria will also be speaking on her experience um, in the Rohingya refugee camps. Uh, so first, I want to open up and see if anyone has experienced 360 video before or virtual reality, or is this a brand new experience? Uh, so you've seen, you've seen. Has anyone else experienced 360 video before? So you have. Okay, for everyone else, we'll show you snippets um, as well of the work that we did um, in Jordan and Bangladesh. Just a brief introduction to our team. Um, I know Montasser already went over it, but uh, just a quick background. So we are the immersive media team of Al Jazeera. Um, this means that we tackle uh, human-based stories through the lens of immersive media and technology. So the idea is that when we're approaching a story, we're always trying to find different ways to push the story forward. How can different mediums really, really um, add a different element or really help you connect or you know, make the story more impactful. And through this, we have started exploring with 360 video, virtual reality, and different technologies. Um, I just want to give you a quick look at our reel so that you kind of have a visual of the different stories that we've done. Um, especially if you haven't seen 360 video before, I think this is a quick taste into the diff different kinds of content that you can create with 360 video. And I just want to keep in mind, so this is going to, yeah. hold on. So when you're watching it on mobile or phone or desktop, you can click and drag and move around. But for the purpose of this, we just laid it out so that you guys can see the whole image.
So as you can see, we've um, been able to work with various communities from all over the world. Um, I think in over about 40 different countries, 30 to 40 different countries. And often what we do is we like to take an approach of um, working with the communities on the ground in order to tell the most authentic, uh, most informed, um, and most impactful stories. Instead of coming in and parachuting into a story, um, just staying for a few days and then leaving, uh, we like to take the approach of investing and empowering the people on the ground in order to do the stories themselves. So that's an approach we often like to take. Um, on the other hand, we also want to make sure that you know, with this immersive medium, uh, it's, there's a potential and there's um, quite some power, I think, in a 360 video because it allows you to step inside into a different world. And with that, I think, comes a lot of responsibility. Um, so we're going to talk about the different approaches we've taken in terms of covering the refugee crisis. Uh, I'm going to start with what we did in Jordan, um, which was a much more, uh, this was a project that we did in partnership with uh, World Vision. And so the way that we approached this is that we went there for seven days. Um, so after the seven days, uh, the product of the, that time was a workshop that we held um, in the refugee camp in Jordan, in Zatari. Um, we produced one documentary um, that follows the hopes and dreams of three young Syrians. We produced another documentary that kind of takes the footage from the workshop and kind of compiles it into a larger documentary. Alongside this, the workshop that we did, I will speak a little bit more on the next slide. Um, we, we did a seven day workshop that uh, was seven Syrian teenagers. And so these were all, you know, like 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds um, who have been living in the camp since, most of them since 2013 when the camp first opened. So imagine, you know, these kids have been living there for the last five to six years, and a large part of what they know um, is now living inside Zatari refugee camp. And a lot of them were from southern Syria, uh, from Dara. Um, so what we did is a lot of these kids were very interested in filmmaking and uh, documentaries and photography. So they all signed up to be part of this workshop where we trained and equipped them with 360 cameras. Actually, this one here, as you can see, you can see in the photos that they're playing around with these cameras. Um, so for seven days, you know, we went through various exercises. Uh, we started off saying, like, you know, here's an introduction to this technology. Um, we're going to be with you for the seven days and help you figure out how to use this. But most importantly, let's figure out the stories that you want to tell. So what we really wanted to accomplish here was to make sure that these kids were taking control of their own narratives, right? I think especially growing in a, in a place like Zatari refugee camp, which is um, at its peak, the fourth largest refugee camp in the world, um, I think they have been so used to this idea of journalists coming in, NGOs being there, um, and a lot of people coming to them and interviewing them and taking stories from the camp. But I think it's been very rare that they had the opportunity to make their own stories and to control their own narrative. So that was really interesting. Um, you know, it's one of the, the questions that um, we had with our partnership with World Vision was like, let's explore um, in, in for the seven year anniversary of the Syrian refugee, uh, the Syrian war, um, what are the, the critical challenges that these teenagers face growing up in a refugee camp, right? So that was kind of the first initial questions that we had before going into this workshop. And then being with these, you know, teenagers, and then you have all these conversations, a lot of brainstorming sessions about the stories that they wanted to cover. Uh, you know, you ask them, like, what are the challenges? But, you know, they would step back and they would, like, look at us and be like, but I want to do a story about, you know, me playing soccer, like I love playing soccer or football with my friends. Um, you know, another one was like, I really want to do a story about theater. I love theater and I'm very passionate about it and it's become, um, you know, a place of inspiration for me in this camp. Uh, so each teenager had various different stories that they wanted to share. Um, and I think it was really powerful to see how when they decided what to share, it was very much, I think, against the normal mainstream media narrative, right? Of, 
you know, these teenagers who have to grow up in a refugee camp. Um, I think it was really powerful. And I actually want to show you an example of one of the stories that they did. So after filming for seven days, um, we ended up taking the footage and editing um, what they shot. And at the end of it, we had seven short 360 videos, all entirely shot and directed by these young teenagers. So let me see. So Yusuf, um, he's 16 years old. His older brother um, opened up a barber shop uh, a few months ago, or a few months before January, which is when we went. And so he really wanted to do a story showcasing his older brother. He's like, he's my closest older brother. He takes care of me. And I want to show you what he's done, you know, what he's done with his life here. So it's about a minute and a half. Um, I would like to share it with you. So let's and so this is 360, you know, you can scroll around. So as you can see, you know, it's I think <coughs> quite an intimate portrait of his relationship with his brother. Um, and the way that we did it is that after brainstorming and him deciding that he wanted to portray his older brother, um, you know, he took out his pen, he took out his notebook, he wrote down the interview questions that he wanted to ask his brother, he mapped out the shots that he wanted to take, and then he went and filmed his first 360 video. So this is just one of seven um, examples that we have of these teenagers. And again, some other examples include um, a girl exploring you know, her passion. She did it about herself, um, and her dream is to become a photographer and a professional filmmaker. So you know, she films herself going around the camp with her camera, um, kind of showing you what her life is like. Um, so, and then another documentary that we did within the same week um, was we actually directed, one second. So the other documentary, the other piece of this project that we did was also directing another virtual reality documentary. So this was maybe about five to six minutes. I'll show you a small clip from that as well. Um, so this is called Dreaming in Zatari. Um, so this follows three of the seven teenagers uh, that we were working with throughout the week. Um, and this focuses on their hopes, dreams, and aspirations for the future. Um, and again, a common um, exercise that we do in our work is to make sure to not fall into, I think, what can be a common route of victimization, right? Of victimizing um, some of the subjects that we're profiling because often we are covering um, some of the most pressing news issues of our time. Um, so in this way, you know, we ask them, you know, what do you want to accomplish in the future? And what we did with this virtual reality documentary is you utilize animations so that we can actually breathe into life uh, visually what they were envisioning for the future. So I'll just show you a snippet so you can understand what I mean. So this is Najad with her mother outside her home. If I could go anywhere, I would be in Paris. And so we'd utilize, right, animation so that you can see her in Paris. And you see the Zatari refugee camp suddenly becomes transformed into where she wants to be.
So. So, you know, this goes on and it interweaves a story of two other teenagers, one of which wants to become a famous singer, you know, and go on Arab Idol. Uh, the other one, um, Tabatik, really wants to become a journalist. And I think a lot of this is informed by her coming into contact with so many journalists in the camp. And she says, you know, I want to become a journalist and for everyone to know my name and I want to travel the world. Um, so it's just, it's a, it's a really like, I think, heartwarming, um, you know, to see these three teenagers. And they have hopes and dreams like every other teenager uh, you might meet. Um, so that was one story. Um, yeah. And then another thing that we did with the seven um, short films that we f filmed with uh, the teenagers is we compiled it into a larger documentary. So if you guys would like afterwards, we can, um, I'll send you guys a link or you guys can watch it on your virtual, re virtual reality headsets. If you guys are wondering what's on your seats. Okay, and it, so yeah, at, at the end of this, we'll have an opportunity to watch in virtual reality in a headset or with the cardboards. Because I think I, as much as I can talk about 360 video and virtual reality and show it to you here, I think the impact is very different once you actually put on a headset. So just keep that in mind, be open-minded about that. Um, so impacts for um, this uh, particular uh, project that we did in Jordan. Um, so it's actually been you know, <coughs> pretty powerful to see people um, put on the headset and watch these stories. Um, Butena was actually at the launch event that we had in London um, with, this with this project where, you know, key stakeholders were present to watch the, the entire library of content that had come out of that 10 days. Um, and we're also premiering in the US and different film festivals. We were just showing last week at Tribeca Film Festival. Um, but I think something that was really key in this was that our, our partnerships, right? I mean, World Vision has millions and millions of followers and an audience that is very different, I think, from the audience that we typically tap into. And then we were also distributing across Al Jazeera channels, AJ Plus. So I think um, it was, you know, we saw a lot of numbers in terms of people who got to watch this content. And let us not forget the most important part, I think, is these kids um, at the end of this came out as, you know, to have published their first 360 videos and to have made their first 360 videos, which I think is a huge accomplishment. You know, I mean, I work with freelancers all the time. We both work with freelancers all the time who are who have been working in this field for years and years and years and still have not, you know, are still also just publishing their first 360 video. So to have 15 year olds do that, I think is really incredible. And now I'm gonna give it to Victoria to talk about the Rohingya refugee crisis. Hello everyone, thanks for coming. As Joy mentioned on Saturday afternoon, um, so I'm Victoria, I'm an another producer on the team, and uh, I've been to, I was in Bangladesh and I covered the Rohingya refugee crisis there. So I wanted to tell you in general what we did, uh, what kind of stories we did about Rohingya refugee crisis within Contrast VR. So one documentary, um, it was a um, high quality, uh, big production documentary with one main character, we filmed it in April 2017, which was still before the main cr sort of crisis exploded in the mainstream media. Um, so we went there before m all the other media went. Um, so we actually covered that story earlier. Then uh, when everything, um, when the news was all over the media, we, went, we shot a general, I call it general because it was without characters, a social video that one of our Al Jazeera staff who was deployed there, he, he's a photographer, so we gave him a 360 camera, the small 360 camera, and he managed also to shoot a short story for us, a short story, 360 story, um, so we published that. And then later, we went back to Bangladesh and we partnered with Amnesty International at that time, and I will tell you how this happened. Um, and then we went back, we filmed the documentary with three characters and we wanted to show uh, the scale of the crisis because that, that, was, that was the story that was going on. 
Uh, so first documentary, I am Rohingya. It's a story of a young uh, woman, Jamalida, living in, in the refugee camp. And uh, it, was, it was her story. Um, so we wanted to focus just on one refugee, not to do a high quality virtual reality documentary about uh, look how it feels to be there or something like that. We just act, we actually wanted to have a story and, and show um, a woman her daily life and her resilience to the situation. And also, we uh, fused real life vi virtual reality footage with uh, 360 animations that recreate her recollections of persecution in Myanmar. So um, the story um, is actually goes really deep. Uh, she tells her story, and uh, and again, as Joy mentioned, watching things in in uh, virtual reality headsets, then you really understand the impact, and you immerse in that story, and and you understand the whole process that this woman had to go through and how strong she is and, and how um, you know hopeful she is actually for the future. Um, sorry. Hmm. Not. So the next one, social video. Um, so this again, um, as I told you, it was very quick. It was a very quick turnaround because our photographer was there and he said, Victoria, I can film something. Uh, it's, it's really difficult because basically with these cameras, what's happening, you have to place the camera in a good location, then you have to run, hide somewhere, come back to pick up the camera. So if you imagine how many people were there and what kind of conditions, it was rainy season, the, the, it, it was just so muddy, and there were so many people. Um, you can see even the shot on the right, there were, it, it, it just, it was impossible. And Shokat was telling me, it, it, it's like, he was like, I don't know if I can do it, I can just try, uh, what can I do? Maybe I, I don't know how to use, if I can use a tripod, because if I leave a tripod, somebody might take it, run away. He was just so confused, I was like, look, let's do what we can, because I think, this is really important, and to get that footage, it's really important. So what he did, and even the shot, what he was doing, he was holding the camera like that super steady on his head, and we could see even him. But um, so we normally don't would, wouldn't use this footage. But in that sort of situation, it was really um, pressing issue. Uh, all the media was covering, and we saw that we have an opportunity to have a 360 footage of that crisis. And uh, we put this one and a half minute video together. We posted on, on Facebook, on social media of Al Jazeera. And then we looked at it and we understood how powerful it is, especially in these kind of stories, where you actually can see how many people are there. You can look around and see what's going on, how, how, are the, how is the situation. You can look down and you see, you see the road, how, how much mud there is and, and, and how people are struggling and fighting with each other to get the food. It was just really overwhelming and, and uh, it, it really showed and, and sort of confirmed us that this is why uh, 360 and virtual reality in, in some cases are it's super powerful and super impactful. And it just, of course, depends, as Joy also mentioned, how we approach those stories and how we do those stories. So then, when we published, we decided to publish I Am Rohingya, even though we filmed it in April, we were holding back uh, from publishing because we wanted to show it in film festivals around the world, and uh, it got accepted to film festivals, and we were really excited about that, but we decided that it's important to publish at that time, not wait much further, because the story, people need to see it. People need to see Jamalida, and people need to see also how the camp changed. What was the situation? How was it in April, and how is it in October? So we published the story. We wrote a Medium blog about how we decided to go there, why we went there in April, why is it important for us to cover that story, and Amnesty International read that blog post and reached out to us and they said, we love the way you tell the stories and this is super important and please go back and let's tell again stories of what's going on there. So we went back and this is a documentary we produced, Forced to Flee. So we had a little bit different approach now. We had three characters because we wanted to show the scale of the crisis and there are so many stories. And of course, even though we had only three characters, their stories were very, they represented the biggest issues what's going on in, in the camp and, and what kind of persecutions, what kind of feelings people are going through and what kind of conditions they're going through. Um, and then we also got 360 drone footage 
Um, so we managed to get that, and, and it sh really showed how big, ag again, how big is, is, is the crisis. And um, let me show you a little bit so you understand. How do you Troy do it? You get out of this? So when you want to just Okay. So let's see a little bit. Um, this is the film. So you can really see how many people are around. You can understand. So this is the food delivery spot. This is the drone footage that I mentioned. And it's basically, you can see with 360. Uh, we also included some linear footage um, because we thought it's very important to show how people were crossing and how they came to that situation, to those camps. And um, we didn't capture that footage in 360 because when we came, it wasn't happening at that time. People were not coming, but... So you can actually see, and if you were, just imagine if you were wearing virtual reality headsets, you can actually see what are the conditions, and this is one of the main roads, so you can imagine what people have to go through every day. We also included some satellites image, so we merged um, linear footage with the 360 and included it in And here the story ends, so these are people actually telling their story. And as you can see, um, watching a 360 video, there is um, a viewer has a lot of control actually where he or she turns and what they want to focus, what they want to see because um, as well as focusing on the main character and listening to the story, they can also watch what's going on around and, and um, understand the location well and, and what activities people are doing um, and, and all that. So again, this video is also available on the headset if, if anybody of you want to watch it. So it, it's, it's really powerful. Um, impact. Um, so partnering with, um, with different organizations, and as Joy also mentioned, what happened in this case, partnering with Amnesty, we also managed to gather a pretty big audience and distribute it all around the world, and, and we managed to merge these audiences. So we have Al Jazeera audience and then Amnesty International audience. Um, so uh, the, we gathered millions of views for these videos. And um, we also, Amnesty International brought these uh, virtual reality documentary, this Forced to Flee, to the UN United Nations Security Council and showed it to members of, of Security Council. And then after showing the film, um, gave them the recommendations how to solve ref Rohingya refugee crisis. So for example, the sec second secretary of Poland said, it was very powerful material. It's one, to th one thing to hear about it, and it's another thing to see it with your own eyes. This is something that should never have happened, but still we are here. 
So even for the people who had understanding and of the crisis and of course read so much about it, heard so much always in the news and you know um, there was really a lot of material, he still felt like it gave him a deeper understanding or let's say different understanding of the crisis and, and maybe we hope better understanding of the crisis. So it's additional element um, and it's powerful and um, you can see it, in, it as people even mentioned, you can see it as if with your own eyes, um, the crisis. Also, another example of impact, um, it's Jamalida was awarded as a brave voice refuse, refusing to be silenced by an organization raw in war. Um, and uh, when we went back um, to Bangladesh, we actually met her. It was a really interesting experience because uh, the, uh, the, there were so many people, the camp was huge and um, Zara, our editorial lead, was standing next to me and, the, and this um, Rohingya woman runs to her and hugs her and I didn't understand what was going on and then apparently Jamalida saw us, spotted us in the crowded street so it was really, it was really amazing experience and then we told her that she won an award in London, um, so it was it was really emotional. I mean, of course, she didn't know. So we were we told her, we explained to her what was the award, what was it, the situation. So it, it was uh, yeah, it was really emotional moment. So I just put um, a list of I called something to think about. Um, it's sort of from my own experience and sort of from contrast VR experience and editorial guidelines. So. Let's say, don't forget stories that don't receive international media attention. So that's what happened to us, right? What we, we knew about Rohingya cri refugees even before when everything exploded and we went there and, and we, s we knew the story needs to be told. And uh, we managed to get ahead of a lot of people and, and there are so many stories that are forgotten and they shouldn't be forgotten. And it's as journalists, we have to always think about that, not just to you know, run for headlines and, 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 and just read headlines and think like, oh, this is the most important, I'm going there. No, there are stories that need our attention. And uh, highlight resilience and um, resilience and strength. So again, uh, don't victimize the people. So it's, it's sort of on the same line um, that those, the people, it's their life and they have stories to tell. And we shouldn't be the ones who we come and say, you have to show me this, you have to tell me this. No, they have to be the ones who will tell us this is what you need to know, this is what you must see. So that's, that's really important. And there are so many stories, even in those situations, th the people who do things, they don't sit and, and, I don't know, feel hopeless. No, they do things. And let's say even Jamalida, when we come, came back, we saw her volunteering. She was distributing the food. And she said, that's my... Um, I need to do it, that's my duty, because I need to help the new refugees. And, and it was amazing seeing her, and she just took her role. She we saw her every day distributing food, and, and she was very proud of that. Um, again, um, build your narrative around the character, show, he, showcase his her daily life. So it's just, um, the stories are important, and even if it's 360, we still should tell stories. Because a lot of media, many media organizations just think like 360 or virtual reality, we can just put camera somewhere and it will be so cool and it's interesting location and it's um, go there, travel there, see there. No, I mean, there are people and there are stories that need to be told. And this medium is different. You have to learn how to use it, but you can still tell stories. Um, it doesn't need to be just randomly placed camera somewhere. And then, um, another thing, collaborate wi with NGOs and individuals that are experts on the issue. So um, Joy also mentioned we always approach communities in that way. We want to empower communities so they can tell their own stories. Or if we go somewhere to cover something, we want to include as many local professionals and talents as possible. So in other films as well, um, the recent film that I uh, we produced about Yemen, we, um, illustrator was Yemeni, mm, composer was Yemeni, so not even people who are on the ground, let's say fixers or, or co-producers or drivers, but also people, the whole production we tried to include as many people who know the situation on the ground and, and can help us tell as the most 
as authentic stories as possible, authentic stories. Um, yeah, and the last thing, it's more a technical about 360 and virtual reality. So I said, be honest about it. So a lot of times we get these questions, oh, what you do with um, consent, or what you do that, how do you explain people that it's 360? Um, and all these kind of ethical questions, and these are very val these are valid questions, and we have to ask those, and we have to ask them so uh, ourselves. And and uh, whenever people ask me, um, that's what I say: we have to be honest. We have to explain people what's going on. We have to explain what is this, how we are filming it, because for some people it could be scary. We place camera somewhere and we run away from it. If it's in conflict zone, that could be even v very weird. Um, so we have to really think about it, and we have to be, um, we have to know that even telling stories in 360, even if we're focusing on one character, uh, we are actually telling the story of the whole community because a lot of people are around and a lot of people are involved. So we have to tell them what's going on. We have to tell them how um, people will watch the story, why is it important, what impact the story could do and and of course you know people always have a choice to to be in those stories or not um, so yeah that's for me then um, should we do, do you want to continue or do, anybody has any questions maybe we can do that about these two productions or any other productions that we did or any other sort of um, What is this example? So you're going to pull it down so it'll look like this. And there's also a thing here in the middle where you make a compartment for the nose. Okay, so who needs help? Does anyone need help?
iPhone, Samsung, you can use any any yep. camera or any phone that works. It's okay. So download, or if you have YouTube, open it up. Um, come to Contrast yeah. VR's page. Okay, so what you'll do is you play. So if you're wondering what these black things are, I just want to make sure everyone is ready before I move on to the next step. So what you can do with these straps, so you can pull this over. No, the other way, the other way. So make sure that, yeah, exactly, perfect. Um, and then on the other side, this is where you're going to put your face. But meanwhile, it would be helpful if you pull off the white mask here. Because then it becomes a sticker. Okay, so once you pull the white mask off, don't worry, we'll get through this. Okay, and then you can stick this onto the inside here. Because you see, it creates a head strap, so you can wear it like this. You don't have to use it, but it is helpful. So the other white So, once you press play, this is very important. So, once you press play, on the bottom right of the video, you should see a symbol for yeah, a headset. So, you have to press that. And then, once... So, I have to be very honest with you. This